Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this afternoon session to discuss the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program for Specialty Crop Producers here in Tennessee. I'm delighted to be joined by Greer Gill from the Tennessee State Office for USDA Rural uh, Farm Service Agency. She is the Public Affairs and Outreach Coordinator for the State of Tennessee, and will also be accompanied by Ron Eldridge, uh, with the Farm Programs Branch. He's a specialist with the Farm Service Agency here in the state. I do ask that you uh, keep your microphones muted for the duration of this presentation and keep your video cameras turned off. This will make sure that everyone has the best audio and uh, video playback uh, available to them, as well as it'll maintain the recording uh, that will be shared later. Please locate the chat icon uh, on your screen. And if you need to type any questions in to ask uh, Greer, myself, uh, or Ron any questions uh, as we go through the presentation, you can type those into the chat box and I will be sure to, to inform Greer of those questions as they come up. With that being said, Greer, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and we can begin the pre presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Jared. Um, I really appreciate um, y'all letting me join today. Um, we're gonna be talking about the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program for specialty crop producers. Um, and let's see here. Okay, as Jared said, my name is Greer Gill. I am with the Farm Service Agency. And um, we're also going to be joined by Ron Eldridge. He's our program specialist for specialty crops and livestock here in our state office. Um, we're located here in Nashville, Tennessee. So um, greetings across the state, wherever you all may be located. And uh, we want to say a special thanks to UT Extension for helping us uh, host this webinar. And um, we just can't say enough great things about our partnership with UT Extension. Uh, we recognize that y'all are boots on the ground when it comes to getting our producers information. So thank you so much for that. Getting started um, with today's discussion, I'm sure y'all have heard a lot about the CFAP program, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Um, it was part of the CARES Act and you know I, I know that we've heard it in the news We've heard it all over, but we really can't overstate how impactful coronavirus has been for, for everyone, but especially for farmers. And um, I know that it's gotten some headlines, but you know, for us in the ag community, we can't talk about it too much. Um, we, we really cannot put too much emphasis on how much it has really made farmers struggle. So um, the CFAP program is just here to try and provide some support for farmers. Um, during this time. So today we're going to talk about just the basics of the program. Um, we're going to talk about funding availability um, and the NOFA, and you don't need to know what that means yet, we'll get to it. And then we'll kind of spend some time talking specifically about specialty crops. So let's get started. Uh, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, the basic goal is just to provide relief for producers. Um, there's two specific challenges from the coronavirus that this program is addressing, and that's price declines and supply chain disruption. So, you know, we've heard of producer dumping their milk um, down the drain. We've heard about people struggling to get things to the market um, before they've spoiled. And we've also heard about schools and restaurants closing. And, you know, no one really thought before, the, the general public never realized how much farmers rely on those contracts. So CFAP provides relief through direct payments to producers and um, FSA is working to just as quickly as possible get these payments out to producers. Um, and one thing that I'm very proud of, right now we have an average um, five day turnaround. I'm not saying that's happening for everyone, but that is the statewide average right now of a producer filling out an application and then five days later, hopefully getting their money. So that is um, something we're very, very proud of and we're glad to know that the money is getting into the producer's hands as quickly as possible. Um, so to ensure funds serve as many producers as possible, um, when, you, when you submit that application, 
um, and you're approved, you'll receive 80% of the maximum total payment now, um, up to the program payment limit, and any additional amount will be determined by the secretary and announced at a later date. So we have already started the sign up. Uh, we started the day after Memorial Day, so we, we came back very quickly from that, um, from that holiday, and it will be running through August 28th, 2020. So after you apply, um, applic applications are processed as they are turned in, which means that we're not waiting for that August 28th date to get money out. We're just going on and sending the money out the door. Um, because we are trying to get that money out as quickly as possible, we are letting producers self-certify. And what that means is that we're not requiring documentation right now for you know, everything that the producer is reporting. Um, so that's called self-certifying. However, that documentation does need to exist. So we are encouraging, um, and I, you know, UT is amazing. If you all, any producers out there need any resources about how to keep records, um, how to do that kind of thing, uh, UT has excellent resources when it comes to that, but we are asking that you keep your records and then um, keep them for three years. So there will be spot checks. Um, our sister agency, RMA, is going to go back and do spot checks. And then um, also our county committees who are going to be um, looking at this program, they can ask for documentation at any time. So while we don't need the documentation on the front end, we do need it to exist and, and be there on the back end. Okay, now let's talk about eligibility because this is, this is very important. Um, the way that we determined as an agency whether a commodity is eligible for CFAT payments um, was by studying and seeing which commodities experienced a 5% or greater national price decline as a result of coronavirus um, or commodities that had substantial marketing costs of inventories. And um, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, but you see a little asterisk there, and it's not applicable to specialty crops in categories two or three. And a little bit later on in this presentation, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So just put a pin in that right now. Um, but we, we collected all this data to determine this 5% or greater national price decline. And how we got that was by collecting inf information through the, through the USDA, and commodities traded on the future markets. So um, we were looking at a very specific time period and that's from January 13th through 17th all the way through April 6th through 9th. So that, um, that time period is very specific. So January 13th through 17th through April 6th through 9th. We're looking for a 5% decline over that time period. And you can see here our covered commodities include dairy, livestock, non-specialty crops, wool, and specialty crops, which is what we're talking about today. Um, and you can visit that website down there, that www.farmers.gov backslash CFAP. That is your best friend for this program, is that website. You can list, see a list of all the eligible commodities, all the ineligible commodities, and there is a vast array, array of resources there. So, um, if I can give you one takeaway, it is that website. But we're going to talk about a few more specific things. Um, concerning specialty crops, I'll go on and list off a few here. Um, we're talking about almonds, beans, broccoli, sweet corn, lemons, iceberg lettuce, spinach, squash, strawberries, and tomatoes. Um, that's not an exhaustive list. You do need to visit the website to see the full list, but those are some of the more popular items that we're looking at. Okay, so continuing with eligibility, um, I think this first point is one of our most important points, and that is that a producer does not need to be an existing USDA customer in order to do business with us. Um, we are very excited that this program is going to be bringing a lot of people who have not been customers in the past into our offices, and I say into in a very relative sense due to coronavirus. Um, but you'll be invited into our USDA family. <laughs> um, most of our offices are doing business by phone right now, but that doesn't stop us. We have not slowed down one little bit. 
Um, so you don't need to already be an existing customer, but we do recognize there are limitations right now. So that's why we're doing things like self-certifying and um, also just we'll go through a few more things that we're doing so that you'll see we have made accommodations due to the coronavirus. Um, Okie doke. Processing entities for this particular program are not eligible. So that's just one thing to note. Um, but producers who are in the midst of filing for bankruptcy or closing operations, but were still operating within those dates that we discussed, mid-January through mid-April, they can still apply. So anyone who has fallen on some tough times, um, even if you are closing out, you still may be able to take advantage of this program if you had, if you were still operational during the time that we discussed. And um, I know we've probably also seen headlines about Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. At first, there was a little bit of confusion as to whether people could participate in SBA as well as USDA programs. And we do wanna assure you that there's absolutely no conflict there. We want our producers to take advantage of every single option at their disposal. So you can apply for PPP and EIDL and CFAP and every little alphabet soup thing you can think of. <laughs> uh, we love to have a few, few little letters in the mix there. Okay, and I do wanna, I have put this slide in here. We do wanna note that there is um, a payment limitation per entity and person. So um, unlike other FSA programs, we have special payment limitation rules on this. And um, you can just review these here, but we do wanna note this just, you know, we are trying to limit it per entity. And it's also uh, for specialty crops specifically per share of your interest in the crop. So if you are, um, and we'll discuss this more in the examples for specialty crops, but if you are someone who owns 50% of, um, of your farm, then you can only apply for 50% of the crop, if that makes sense. And we'll go into that more later. Um, listed here are commodities that are not eligible. Um, so this, these are commodities that did not suffer a 5% or greater price decline during that time period. Um, and again, there's an exception for two categories of specialty crops that we will discuss later. Um, but I think this is, this is something to point out, and it's that not every producer did experience um, impact from the coronavirus. I think we can all remember um, just a few months ago, it seemed like everyone was making bread. I don't, I don't know about your friends and family, but my friends and family, Everyone was sharing sourdough recipes and, and everyone was going wild and you could not find flour at the grocery store. So that's an example of a commodity that was not impacted and is thusly not eligible for this program, wheat. So um, you can see a list here and you can go to that website that we talked about, the farmers.gov backslash CFAP. I see Jared added it to the chat. Um, so you can click there and see the full list of commodities that are not eligible. Um, and the note down there is USDA may reconsider the excluded commodities if credible evidence is provided. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but if you see a commodity there that's not eligible, um, not all is lost. We, we may have a recourse for you. Okay, so CFAP pro payments, like we said, they're going out the door very quickly. Um, and this program is designed with the intention of providing relief. It is not meant to make any kind of producer completely whole from their losses. Um, so I do want you to keep that in mind. We are, as the federal government, trying to do our best with the money that's been entrusted to us. And we're not trying to make anyone um, just completely whole, but we are trying to do our part to make sure that everyone can stay afloat. So, you know, we just do wanna make that note. And we also wanna note that if anyone has an outstanding debt with the USDA, um, you can still apply for this program. No payment is gonna be withheld to satisfy a USDA debt or a treasury debt. So if that's something that is 
in the back of someone's mind or a concern. Um, it is not something that's going to be part of this program. And also, there's no fee to apply for this program. We want you to be a part of it, and we want to decrease any barriers. Okay, so this is the recourse that I was talking about. Um, if you have an, a commodity that you believe should be part of CFAP but is not part of CFAP, um, there is a notice of funding availability, and you'll, you're going to hear it be called the NOFA because we love an acronym. <laughs> so the NOFA is to allow producers an opportunity to provide information on unlisted crops for consideration in CFAP. Um, basically, if a commodity has not been included in CFAP, um, unless it's something that we have proof of, like we discussed the wheat, we know wheat did quite well um, through coronavirus. But there are some that we just flat out didn't have any information on. And you'll see down at the bottom, like nursery products and aquaculture and cut flowers. There just wasn't any information on that in order to include it in the program. So they put out the NOFA, and we have a quick turnaround on this. It is next Monday that this is due. Um, but if anyone has any commodities that are not listed right now and you believe should be listed, and you have information that you can provide to the USDA, like your market left, um, or you, you saw a price decline that you can talk about that happened in your community, you could enter that data into the NOFA and peak producers across the nation are entering this information. So there will potentially be commodities added to the CFAP. Um, and afterwards, I will be providing this slideshow um, as well as links to things like the NOFA and all that kind of thing to, to Jared and UT Extension so that they can get this out to you all and we can make sure that everyone has all the information needed um, if you would like to go through the NOFA process. Okay, and with that, we're gonna be getting into our specialty crop specific area. And specialty crops are my favorite. Look at how pretty they are. Okay, so there are three different categories for specialty crops um, and what makes them eligible, eligible for this program. Um, the first category covers crops that meet the 5% or greater decline in price um, during that time period, January 15th through April 15th. Next in category two, um, that covers crops that were delivered and spoiled um, or were unpaid. Then category three, um, that's for a commodity that was not delivered. So that means any commodity that was left on the farm, um, a shipment that didn't leave the farm was just told to hang back, um, or any acres that were not harvested. All of that falls under category three. And again, uh, you can visit the CFAP farmers.gov website and, and read more about these. There's a lot of very handy information there. Okay, so for payments, the commodities can fall into one or more categories. And you'll see that little chart there. Um, if you visit the website, you'll see a much larger chart with every crop and there will be little check marks out to it. Um, so each commodity is not restricted to only one category. Um, if a producer has crops that fall into more than one category um, or multiple commodities in one application, then producers still just have one payment. So you see artichokes there under category one, category two, category three. Um, you will still only receive one payment even though it's in multiple categories. Okay, so when producers are paid, they will be paid by their shares. So when applying for the program, the application will only reflect the share of the portion of the crop that the producer has specified. So to clarify, it's okay to have a commodity that goes across all three categories, um, but for ownership, the payment would reflect the share that the producer has interest in. So if a producer is responsible for 50% of a share of 
acreage and a crop, their application would only be for 50% of the cost and what was lost. And as a result, the associated payment. We're gonna go into some examples that'll kind of explain this a little bit more. Um, we do want to point out and let you know that crops that are in inventory that are available to be sold on April 16th or later and have a future value are not eligible. So um, what we're talking about there are things like apples and potatoes, onions, all that kind of stuff that you can store in a cold facility and have a longer shelf life. Um, those would not be eligible for coverage under categories two and three. So just one little thing to note there. So we'll go more specifically into category one here, the price decline. Um, this covers 80% of the national price decline, and we want this reported in pounds. So um, this is another thing where it's so important that you need to be maintaining your records. Um, as we discussed at the very beginning, this is a self-certification program, but we want to ensure that you all have records on hand in the event that they're pulled for a spot check. Um, if you don't have documentation right now, that's okay. It doesn't prevent you from applying. Um, but however, if you're pulled for a spot check, you need to make sure that um, you do have documentation in place. So if you don't have documentation now, okay. But it needs to be worked on so that you have it very quickly. Um, okay, so AMS is our sister entity and they're the ones who are gonna be doing spot checks. And um, if you have any questions, you can contact AMS and they can provide guidance for what type of documentation would work. Um, so here for, for price decline, it looks like you can have a bill of sale and that would document the price you received for the crop. Um, and things like this, along with all of your planting records and things like that, um, they're gonna help you determine that price decline. <clears throat> Okay, it's also important to note here that it doesn't make a difference what use it's sold for. As long as the commodity was sold or marketed during the time, they're talking about mid-January through mid-April, it's considered category one payment. So um, the example given here is that you may have lemons that you grew for the fresh market, you know, intending to sell it straight to consumers, but instead you had to sell it for hog feed you still sold it. So um, that would fall into category one. It doesn't matter how it was intended to be sold as long as it still was sold. So we'll look at an example real quick. Um, Francis Farmer has a vegetable operation and grows high tunnel tomatoes for sale to restaurants and a farmer's market in a nearby city. Um, Francis has 100% ownership interest in about 2,000 pounds of tomatoes that were sold between January 15th and April 15th. So Francis Farmer will certify to 2,000 pounds, 100% of what was taken to market as the volume of production sold on the CFAP application form. Um, and one thing to note here is that if Francis had a partner, say, another farmer who Francis was sharing with, um, Instead of certifying to 2,000 pounds, Francis would certify to 1,000 pounds because um, Francis only has a 50% interest in that. And instead of 100% ownership, it'd be 50% ownership. So if that makes sense. And if you have any questions about that, you know, you can just lay that out with your local farm service agency person. Um, explain to them everything. We would rather you go into extreme detail rather than fill out the application the wrong way. Okay, so we'll go into category two. So this is um, things that were delivered and spoiled or unpaid. So payments for crop shipments that left the farm between January 15th and April 15th. Those are our very important dates right there. And these payments offset 30% of the national sales value that was lost on crops that shipped from the farm but were spoiled or unpaid. So um, again, this is done in pounds. And um, documents that you wanna look for on this one, um, we would like to see a letter from the buyer explaining a non-payment. So this applies to producers who have met contractual obligations 
but who have not been paid. But you know, you can have the buyer reach out and explain why they didn't pay. So we do want to note that price risk does not apply for this category. That was the asterisk that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. So this, this is all just about the fact that it was delivered and then ended up spoiled or unpaid. <clears throat> okay, we'll look at an example real quick. Again, Francis, quite the entrepreneur, has 50 pounds of tomatoes delivered to a local restaurant twice a month, every month from January 15th through April 15th. The restaurant paid for the shipments received in January and February, but then March and April did not pay for the restaurants or did not pay for the tomatoes because there was no one in the restaurant. So Francis would certify to 200 pounds um, as the volume of production shipped but not sold. And how you get that is um, there were four payments because she's getting paid. I think Francis is a woman, I don't know. I'm going with Francis as a woman. <laughs> um, Francis was paid twice in January, twice in February, and then March there would have been two payments, and April there would have been two payments. So um, that ends up being 200 pounds because each of those payments was for 50 pounds. So <clears throat> that that is how you reach the 200 pound mark. Uh, we do want to note that if a product can be marketed after 416, um, so this was through April 15th, but starting April 16th, if the product could be marketed, it is not eligible for CFAP. So in this, in this example, we use tomatoes. But let's say that we had instead been talking about onions or something that has a longer shelf life. Um, if it could be marketed after April 16th, it is not eligible for CFAP. So that's just, again, something that you wanna talk about with your local FSA representative to make sure that you are applying these, these rules the right way. And if you have any questions, they can help you with that. Okay, so for category three are items that were not delivered. Uh, anything that was left in the field, on the farm, um, or never, never made it to market for whatever reason. Payments um, were offset 5.875% of the national value of unpriced crops. And um, it is to be noted that category three, you wanna report in acres. Um, so category one, category two, you're reporting pounds. But for category three, we're popping over into acres. Um, so that's just one thing that you really need to notice and, and that's important for your documentation. So again, for documentation, you wanna look at your planting records, your seed and fertilizer records, any um, harvest records, and, and hopefully everyone is, is keeping these types of records just as a matter of course. Um, but if you're not, then I would recommend speaking with your local UT Extension um, they have a lot of really excellent resources for record keeping. So that's something that um, we do like to see producers keeping those records and, and having those in case there's a spot check. Okay, and we'll look at an example real quick. Again, Frances is out there with, with her tomatoes. Oh, it is a woman, there's a her. <laughs> so the restaurants, all closed in March 2020, leaving Francis with an additional eighth of an acre of tomatoes that were unable to be marketed or any other buyer before they spoiled. So the tomatoes remained unharvested and on the farm. So Francis would certify to an eighth of an acre as the acres with production not shipped or sold on the CFAP form. Um, I do want to note here that a really common question for category three is um, if the commodity is eligible if the commodity was intended to go to the farmer's market and the farmer's market didn't open? And the answer is yes. Um, if I know that through coronavirus, farmer's markets were made um, an essential, what do you call that? They were just made essential, um, like, like we were, like the USDA, um, because they're agriculturally based but still some of them didn't open. 
So if a producer had intended to go to the farmer's market, but then that market disappeared, that is that would fall under category three and um, can be accepted on, on an application for payment. So I hope that those examples and going through those categories helped a little bit. Um, but again, if you have any questions, we'll discuss, um, there's a call center you can call and there's also your local office that you can speak to if you have any additional questions. Okay, so we're gonna go into some general information just for specialty crop growers. Um, it should be noted that there is no separate organic payment rate. So it is just an across the board payment rate for each commodity. So just some, some tips when you're applying, if you do have um, an ineligible commodity, um, you don't need to include that on your application. Um, even if you intend to put it through the NOFA process, um, we still don't wanna see that on the application. You can always go back to your application and amend it if you're applying for other eligible commodities. And if you do have eligible commodities, please go on and get your application in so that we can get money to you. Um, but any ineligible commodities need to go through that NOFA process. Um, as we talked about, um, self-certification process is so important and all the documentation is something that you really need to hold for three years after this program. And um, Let's see. If you apply for a commodity under category two and three, and later it's added as eligible under category one after the application has been processed, you can actually come back in and also amend your application at that point for category one payment, and we'll work with you on that. So the, the general thing is we really want you to come on and, and start applying um, and then if there's any issues, we're going to work through them on the back end with you. Okay, so if you have any questions about applying for CFAP, um, there are so many helpful tools. And the number one thing that we talked about is that website, the farmers.gov backslash CFAP. Um, there's frequently asked questions. There's um, a YouTube video that you can watch that takes you through the application generator and payment calculator. Um, and you can watch it just to see how you fill it out. And then, and then you can go through the application itself. Um, and also just in case you have any questions or, or unfamiliar with FSA, you should know that we post all of our policy handbooks. It is some dense material, I'm not gonna lie about that, but sometimes it does help to just read it and take a little overview, but if you don't want to read policy, because there are many people who don't want to read policy, there are always people available to help. And speaking of, if you are applying, we have many options to help you. So um, right now for coronavirus, most of our offices are closed or are in the in the process of opening slowly. So a lot of times we have one person in an office and everyone phone. So um, we do have a lot of things that we have added to to give you access to people, even though you can't physically visit in an office for every single office. Um, so one thing is our call center, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, but also our offices have phone appointments available. Um, and some of our offices, if they have moved into different phases, can even schedule you for an in-person visit. And um, if that happens, then you'll go in and it will just be you in there, um, along with maybe one other, you know, there might be one other employee there besides the one you're visiting, but everyone will stay socially distant and, and you know, you'll wear masks and do all the things. We are trying to keep everyone as safe as possible, um, but we do have options for phone appointments too. So it will just depend. This is a county by county thing. So, um, you'll have to talk with your local county to see where they are in the phases. Right now, we are still very early across the state. Um, most are in phase one, but here in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna have some getting into phase two, um, which will be that we can have maybe one person come in the office. So just keep a lookout for that. And if you have any questions, you can call your local office. We'll discuss how to do that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> I do wanna let everyone know that we do have language interpretation options available. 
So um, if there's any kind of language barrier um, or difficulties, we do have ways to, to get over that and, and make sure that everyone has accessibility to these programs. And um, also we, we do wanna shout out again to our partner organizations like UT hosting this call, um, Tennessee Department of Agriculture. There's so many people, uh, Farm Bureau, I could, the list goes on and on. There's so many people who are helping us promote this program and learning more about it so that they can help producers. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to almost anyone in the agricultural community and you can reach out to me as well and, and we will get you in contact with the right person. So I wanna tell you more about our call center. Um, I think most people hear the term call center and they think, oh no, I don't wanna to talk to someone who doesn't know about this. I, I wanna to talk to, to someone who really, really knows. Um, but I do have great news. Our customer call center is actually staffed by existing employees. So um, this is a nationwide call center and what has happened is we have pulled employees from every state um, and we actually have some Tennessee people serving in this call center, which we're very proud of. So if you call this customer call center, you are gonna be talking to people who have experience, who understand our employees, who understand this program. And so I think it's really an extraordinarily useful call center. Um, and so I very much encourage you, if you have any questions, you can call this number. Um, I will tell you right now, our local offices are slammed. Um, I told you that we were on average getting money out in five days, and that is incredible. Um, but one way that's happening is by utilizing the customer call center. So if you have a, just a basic question, um, this may be the best option for you to call this customer call center and then go on and set up an appointment with your local service center. Um, but this might be a very good place for you to start if you have any questions. Um, and it will be people who can actually take care of you. Now, if you are someone who is new to the USDA, and I don't know who on this call is new or who has been uh, involved before, but if you're new to USDA, we do have some great things about this program. Um, the first thing is that you don't need a farm number um, in order to, to work on this program. So if you're not familiar with us, you may not have heard the term farm number, but that's really just something that we use in order to um, identify your farm and, and it helps us track which programs you're involved in. But for this program, you don't have to have a farm number in order to apply and complete the application. Um, but what we'll do is after you've applied, then we'll have local FSA follow up with you and they'll help you get that farm number and get you set up so that then you can start working with us on other programs. And we have a great variety of programs. Um, also, if you're new to USDA, please call that call center that I just gave you. Um, get help if you have any questions, because we don't, we don't want anyone to just be wondering um, and left without any kind of customer service. We really want you to have resources and have a warm voice on the end of the phone that, that can help you. Um, and if you're new to USDA, we did just want to give you kind of some information that you'll need in order to fill out the form. So your name and address, um, your personal information, including your tax ID. Um, we do need to know the general structure, like we talked about, like how much of a share do you own in this farm? Um, you'll need to get your adjusted gross income and direct deposit information, because we want to pay you. <laughs> um, so some of this I know can, can feel like it's some pretty personal information, but I do want to assure you that when it comes to your adjusted gross income, to your direct deposit, um, absolutely any information you give us is going to be kept confidential. Um, even as we have moved into working remotely, um, one great thing is that we have been able to start new processes that allow us to encrypt information, um, that allows us to sign in and sign out. Um, we have just so many things in place to ensure that all of your privacy is going to be protected at all costs. And your personal information is something that we take incredibly seriously. So, um, you know, I get a lot of questions about that from producers because they, 
they can get protective as well they should in this day and age. You know, you don't know who is trying to just take advantage of you, but I can assure you that the Farm Service Agency is not, and we will do everything we can for to, to protect your information. So, what happens after you sign your application? Um, hopefully you get a payment very quickly. <laughs> But what happens after you sign it, um, our offices will begin reviewing um, everything in it, and they have 60 days from signing to resolve any issues that they see in there. And after they approve it, it's sent to processing for payment. And then if there's any issues, you know, they'll reach out to you. So um, hopefully it will be a very streamlined process and, you know, no box will be left unchecked, no questions will arise, but if there are any questions, then you will receive a call from your local office. They'll handle it as quickly and professionally as possible and then get you a payment as, as fast as they can. So just another list of tips. We talked about the, the website, I hope enough for you to remember to visit it. <laughs> Um, but also utilize the call center. Again, I see Jared has posted that number into the chat. So please take advantage of that and um, take advantage of the virtual applications. We do have options for paper applications that can be mailed in, um, but we do like those virtual applications because they do allow you to have that level of um, encryption and peace of mind when it comes to that. And I will remind you again that if you have a commodity that you believe needs to go through the NOFA process, um, that does have to be submitted before next Monday, June 22nd. Okay, now if you want to get more news about FSA, we do have an option to get updates. So again, I'm going to send this whole presentation um, out to UT that they will share with you. And so you can click on this link in this PowerPoint when you get it and sign up for alerts. And then if you wanna contact your local service center, I wanna show you how to do that. <clears throat> You'll visit um, fsa.usda.gov backslash state offices. We're in the state office for Tennessee. So backslash Tennessee. And then over on the left-hand side, you're gonna see something that says county offices, and it's gonna take you to this interactive map. So what you just do is click on your county, and some of our counties, I will say, um, share a service center. So don't be alarmed if you click on your county and it doesn't say your county. It's probably, it may say the next county over if they are serviced by a different service center. So I'll show you what a listing looks like. Um, here is the Wilson County Farm Service Agency. I just picked that at random, but you can see it gives the address. It tells you who the county executive director is. It tells you who the farm loan manager is. Um, so if you all are in need of any loans or anything like that, we do offer very many loans, um, specifically also some for beginning farmers, if we have any beginning farmers out there. Um, so there's a lot of contact information here. You can also get the mailing address if you wanna swing by and just know where it is. Um, but I wanted you to have that information in case you do wanna reach out to your local service center. Also, if you call the um, call center number, they can just connect you straight over to a local service center. So um, it should not be hard to find your local service center's information, but um, just in case, this is a very good way to find them. And with that, I have completed my presentation. And I wanna say thank you so much to everyone who has been on this call. Um, I hope you haven't gotten tired of listening to my voice. <laughs> but um, I do wanna say thank you again to UT for hosting us. And um, I do wanna open it up now to questions. I will remind you that I have Ron Eldridge here. Um, he is our farm program specialist for specialty crops. So he's probably gonna be fielding a lot of the, the questions, um, but we'll open the floor now. So everyone can just kind of jump in and, and we can have some conversation going. Hello. Yes. Ask. Ask your boss. Yes, I was wondering, well, we have uh, livestock 
Mm -hmm. Is there a section that qualifies us for livestock? Yes, uh, livestock is one of the eligible commodities uh, that we're providing benefits for. Uh, I should introduce myself. You're listening to the voice of Ron Eldridge, program specialist with the, in the state office uh, there in Nashville, Tennessee. With the CFAP program, I'm dealing with livestock, also specialty crops. And yes, to answer your question, we do have a segment uh, of this program, the CFAP program, that deals with livestock, eligible livestock. Uh, <clears throat> I, I'm not going to attempt to give you all of the information on livestock, but I can refer you to our fact sheets that are available on each and every crop uh, that is paid for or we're providing benefits for through this CFAT program. Uh, our most <clears throat> applied for livestock at this time has been cattle uh cattle and we're looking at cattle that have been impacted as you know uh because of the the the, the price decrease and also then we have a section of it that we're dealing with uh payments to producers based on highest inventory so yes to answer your question in short livestock is a part of the cpap program Are there other questions concerning either livestock or specialty crops? I do have a question, Ron, and this is Margarita. Um, on the first example that Greer showed on category one payments, so in her example, she was saying, uh, Farmer Francis um, was selling to restaurants and farmers markets. And so if it's category one, um, I have to document a 5% decline in price, a 5% or larger decline in price. How am I supposed to document a 5% decline in price when I'm selling through farmers markets and restaurants? Uh, do I show that the prices I was setting for my produce in, do I have to show my prices for 2019 and somehow show my prices for 2020? How do I document when I'm not selling wholesale but farmers markets and restaurants? How do I document that 5% decline in price? Okay. Um, now, the, the, to be eligible, and to make application, the producer will not have to provide that information up front. That information will be required after you've received payment and if you are pulled randomly for a spot check. Now, what we're telling all of our applicants, all of our participants, is that however you are impacted through the marketing process for each and every crop, that was in affected, keep your production documentation for a period of up to three years. Now, we're not, we don't wanna get into the habit of trying to explain everything to the producer up front. Do it like this, do it like that. We want you to have all of the information in the production of that crop. That would be, the actual in the field production, in the greenhouse production, and also through the marketing process. Prices would be included in that. Now, <clears throat> when the reviews, if they're happen to be pulled for review, we don't really know at this time what, uh, uh, what our role as FSA will be in that review because AMS is the group, that's the agricultural uh, uh, group that put together these numbers for us, the 5% decline and, and, and all of those eligibility requirements as far as that goes. So please tell your producers when they're making their certifications on the 3114 application for this program to maintain all records associated with crop production and marketing. Did I answer your question, Margarita? Yeah, thank you, Ron. And You're uh, welcome. A follow-up question on category three. So
So there was an example, for example, that like the farmer's market did not open on the date that it was supposed to open. So basically I had to leave my crops on the field because I was, I was not able to take them to the farmer's market. So that will be likely to be applied or to be qualified for category three payment. Now, what happens if it is unlikely because of the timing that you are specifying between January 15 and April 15 that there was a summer farmer's market open at that time. But what if I was selling through a winter's farmer's market and they closed earlier because of the coronavirus? So let's just say they were supposed to be open until mid-March and they decided to close it like a week earlier and I was not able to sell my produce. Is that, uh, is, will that, would that, will that produce that didn't go to the winter's farmer's market because they closed earlier, will that qualify for category three payments? Uh, now we got to really remember what we're looking at. Uh, you're saying that this is a, a hand harvested crop that was picked, but uh, it, it went, it, the market was not open, so. Well, I, I didn't pick it because the farmer's market, it was a, a crop that was on the field, ready to go to a farmer's market on a high tunnel, ready to go, but then the farmer's market decided we're gonna close this week as opposed to two weeks from now. And therefore, I didn't have any market for my crop so I had to leave it on the, on the field because I, was, I had nowhere to take it. Yes, uh, long story short, those crops would be eligible. Now, uh, we're looking at a long list of crops that uh, are eligible for this program, but we have to realize that we are in Tennessee. Uh, uh, we have very few crops, even very few cool season crops that would be at a marketable stage during the time frame in which has been established January through April. You could possibly have more crops that were grown under high tunnels, greenhouses and the likes that would be eligible. Now, just uh, I was asked this question on one of our previous webinars as to what crops, specialty crops, have been uh, applications have been made uh, for in Tennessee. And I'd like to give you that information at this time. Uh, in Robertson County, two examples of specialty crops that have been uh, made application on would be spinach and mushrooms. Just to give you an idea of some of the crops that we're, we're seeking out that we could possibly have producers come in to request benefits. Uh, in Lauderdale County, we have an application on file for strawberries. Now, uh, we're looking at most of the strawberries here in Middle Tennessee probably are not at a harvestable stage until somewhere around the middle of April. West Tennessee, they could possibly be just a little bit, a couple of weeks earlier than we are in Middle Tennessee. So. They've had, they have an application on file that has been approved for strawberries, Lauderdale County. Uh, East Tennessee, we have an application on file for cabbage, fresh market cabbage. So uh, you can see there's a, a, a vast number of crops that uh, 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 could possibly meet the criteria of eligibility to go with this program. But yes, uh, you know, the 5%, the we don't calculate, we're just looking at the overall crop. Uh, producers who had shipped, but subsequently did the, 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 the produce uh, spoiled or is non-marketable, they are eligible. And then like you were saying, their marketplace dried up, they had the crop, they left it in the field, uh, uh, never was shipped, uh, however that fits in. Number three, those people are certainly eligible for crops that were uh, at a, at a uh, otherwise marketable state uh, or in storage uh, uh, for the ethical period of time. 
That was very helpful. My pleasure. Any other questions? Ron, is there, I've got a couple of call, um, Ron, could you mute yourself just here? Hello? Okay, perfect. Ron, so I've got two questions that were submitted um, when people registered for this workshop. Uh, the first question is, we grow five acres of hemp for medicinal use last year and have not been able to sell any of it. Are we eligible for any programs related to CFAP? Okay, run that question. I had to unmute my phone, so that was kind of distracted. If you would please repeat that. Sure. So it says we grow five acres of hemp for medicinal use last year and have not been okay. able, able to sell any of it. <laughs> Sorry, hemp and tobacco are not a part of this CFAP program. Okay. The second question is, as honey and hive products producers, are there any stipulations or opportunities that are particular to my industry that I need to pursue since I'm facing additional costs of marketing because my traditional markets such as fairs and festivals are not open this year? As far as a specialty crop, honey has not been listed. Uh, as Greer uh, specified in her presentation through the PowerPoints, any crops that have not been identified as eligible for this program, they would need to go through the NOFA and do it rather quickly. Uh, that's the uh, uh, National Office of Funding Availab Authority. Uh, Notice, <laughs> I, I changed that. I change their uh, acronym all the time, but it's the Notice of Funding Authority. Uh, they have not been ad identified at this time as have suffered uh, through AMS data, but that's not to say that they will not be identified. But the best thing for you to do is to encourage your producers, five acres of honey, I don't know how they put it in a, a Oh, no, that was the other that was the other part of that. But anyway, uh, your honey producers would need to file under the uh, at NOFA and make the request known by close of business June the 22nd. That's fastly approaching, and uh, uh, the sooner the better to get them uh, their name in the, in the hat to possibly get a portion of the pie. Okay, thank you, Ron. Okay, and it, even after this call, if y'all come up with some questions, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not the guru on this, but I, I will try to help you in any way possible to make sure you get an educated answer that you can assist the producers. We really need y'all's help. Uh, uh, in my country swing, y'all's help <laughs> in getting the word out on this program. Uh, I know this is for specialty crops, but I want to remind y'all that uh, if you come out in contact with livestock producers, please let them know what we got to offer them. Please let them know to come in. We realize that the final sign-up date is not until August 28th, but we would like for them to come visit with us in some shape, form, or fashion, whether it be through telephone, fax, email, what have you, in this uh, coronavirus uh, era, but we really would like for them to come in and make application for these uh, program benefits. Uh, we had some programs that we administered uh, in 2016 and 2019 to livestock producers. Uh, there are a great many of livestock producers that never darken into our doors at FSA because they say that we don't have anything for them, but we do have stuff for them. And this is one example. Uh, we're willing to pay uh, 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 benefits on sold livestock and also based on their highest number in inventory through May. So uh, please uh, spread the word. We've only had, we've only scraped the top of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, as far as our livestock producers, based on past program uh, participation with our livestock program. So, so if you would please spread the word, uh, make them aware of where they can, uh, the resources we have in place for them to get information, 
and we'd really like to offer our services to assist them uh, in this trying times in the marketplace. Good question. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ron. No problem. And I'll jump back in. This is Greer again. And um, I just wanted, thought it might be good to throw out a few um, statistics. Um, we actually fill out um, statistics every Monday, so we have some really good numbers to share. And one of those is that already, you know, we started on May 26th. So in just a very short period of time, we already have um, $42.1 million in Tennessee that has gone out. Um, and that's a little bit over 8,000 applications. So as Ron was saying, we still have a lot of producers um, who need to come in and, and get this money out there because we know that we, we still, we have more than 8,000 producers in the state, but we are excited that we have $42.1 million um, out there impacting economies in Tennessee. And I know that it's making a difference for our producers. So um, you know, there we're ready to give out more money if if people want to come come get it. Very good. Are there any additional questions? Uh, if anybody has one, they can put it in the chat box here, or they can unmute themselves and ask the question, uh, like others have. If there are no additional questions, I would like to once again thank Greer and Ron for their time today to be a part of this webinar and provide their valuable information on the CPAP programs offered by USDA Farm Service Agency. This recording will be saved and shared on the Center for Profitable Agriculture's website and on our YouTube page. We will also send out uh, the links to this recording to anybody that has registered for this workshop so you can find that email and access this information later. I put the link to the farmers.gov CFAP website in the chat as well as the phone number for the customer call center if you would like to save that information to use later uh, that will be there and available to you. Otherwise uh, seeing no additional questions I uh, will thank everyone for their time and participation today and I uh, hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you.